perfetto, allora io credo che possiamo proseguire e andare a entrare appunto nel tema specifico della sessione di oggi che è appunto il turismo e benessere naturale. Abbiamo la nostra, eh, vedo la nostra discussant che è già collegata, che è, la, eh, che è Marina Mura, eh, che quindi a cui, alla quale diciamo, lascerei volentieri la parola, anche se in questo momento non vedo collegato il primo relatore, però magari intanto inizia, può iniziare Marina Mura con eh, la introduzione appunto a questa sessione e la sua eh, particolare presentazione. Sì, non è collegato ancora il professor Watkins. Allora, buongiorno. Buongiorno, allora, ci Marina. Eh? buongiorno Marina, che piacere. Buongiorno, forse questo è il professor Watkins. Sì? Ah, ecco. Ah. Welcome. Welcome, uh, professor Watkins. Sì, uh, I think you, you need to activate the, the, the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm now going to try and uh, upload the uh, talk. So this might take just okay. a little while. Ok. okay. Eh, credo che forse il professore allora forse vuole iniziare. Sì. Lo facciamo iniziare. Sì, va bene Marina. Allora magari okay. le due parole dopo. Dopo, sì. Um. To avoid mirroring, oh dear. That looks very... Let, let's try another way. Hold on just a second. Don't worry. No. There we are. Is that showing now? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that you uh, are able to switch to the... through the, the, um, the slides. Uh, We, we cannot see it widescreen at the moment. Right, okay. I'm just doing that. Is that okay now? Uh, no, but uh, I, we, we saw that uh, many people have has this problem that uh, they cannot uh, switch to the widescreen uh, uh, mode. So uh, the, the, the solution we had found uh, until now is that, um, okay, now you disconnected the, the, the PowerPoint. We cannot oh, see it. Oh, right. Any okay. longer. Let's, let's, let's just uh, end show. I, ha I, can, I can present the entire screen, a window or a tab. I wonder which is the best. Let's, uh, let's try Yeah, you try, uh, try one and option and then we we'll see. Okay. Ha lo stesso problema del Sì, no, la prossima volta bisogna fare con Zoom. Intanto ce lo vediamo. It can be cute. Let's try another one. I'll try a tab. Let's see what that says. No, it's odd. We tried this yesterday and it worked. So I'm going to try exactly what I did yesterday and share. Can you see now? Yes, we, we can see, but not white screen. But uh, I think uh, you can uh, uh, simply um, switch uh, um, through the slides by selecting them on the um, left. Uh, yes. Button. Yeah, I think. So can you see the first slide now? Yes, yes. So I will select down and, uh, and I hope you can see at least some of them. Yeah, I think that's the best solution. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me along uh, to give this talk, which listening to uh, Maria Luisa's talk uh, has a, a lot of connections in terms of the linking of sustainability, aesthetics and inclusion in looking at tourism and um, landscape and in some ways what one might think of as the therapeutic values of landscapes. 
Um, and just as a, um, a, an opening slide, I'm showing a, 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 a watercolour by Edward Lear, a 19th century English artist who toured along, um, who lived in, in uh, the Riviera for many years and did many travel accounts and many paintings and drawings. And uh, in looking at his biography, a lot of those drawings were associated with his way of, as it were, trying to come to terms with existence and using landscape as a type of therapy in some ways. Um, uh, now, in this talk, I'm going to explore the relationship specifically between trees, recreation and tourism through a series of case studies. Um, I'm going to start in Nottinghamshire, where I am at the moment in Nottingham, and talk about Sherwood Forest. Then I'm going to talk about some general aspects. Then I'm moving closer to you in, in Italy. I'm going to be talking about a project on uh, the Riviera Palms, which I did with uh, Pietro Piana, who's, I think, uh, at the conference. Then looking at the idea of rewilding. And then finally, looking at trees in cities, ending up in Rome, where I was hoping to be today. So looking at Sherwood Forest, first of all, I just want to look at the way in which individual trees and areas of forest become associated with particular tourist moments and, and, and the way that they change and can tell us about the way that landscapes were perceived over time. So the things I'm exploring in this talk are the relationship between history, landscape, tourism, and ideas of therapy, I suppose, in the broadest sense. Now, Sherwood Forest has a whole series of meanings associated with it, particularly the idea of Robin Hood, the, um, uh, the uh, medieval uh, um, man famous for stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, uh, but also for many ancient oak trees. And this particular tree here, uh, from an engraving of 1790 is known as the major oak and it was become famous by painters and from tourism all the way since the last 300 years even in this drawing of 1790 we see a picture there's a little uh, drawing of someone there who I think will be someone there who was collecting money uh, from the landowner so you could look at the tree uh, you might find this map a bit murky if you can't see it uh, in full, uh, but uh, that shows the, the major oak, as it's known, mapped as the principal feature in this area called the Sherwood Forest Country Park. And then if you look at different representations of the tree over time, uh, this is a tree, the same tree in the 1890s, Again, with someone here who is collecting money, and at that stage you could pay a small amount of money to go into the tree. And nowadays, more recently, this is the same tree, uh, um, which has been managed to protect the, the branches from falling on visitors. Uh, uh, now you're not allowed to go into the tree, it's, it's a, but it's a place where Many hundreds of thousands of people visit this tree each year to look at its conservation value and to consider its age and the history. And it's a, it's, so it's a sense, it's a type, I suppose, of green tourism, the ultimate type of green tourism, perhaps. But of course, there are conflicts in the immediate area. How does one combine that sort of protection of individual trees with the need to generate income from cutting trees down. Uh, and just less than half a mile from that tree, we have an area also within the Sherwood Forest National Nature Reserve where coniferous trees were planted in the early uh, 20th century and are now being felled uh, to to um, um, for, for, for money, but also to try and <clears throat> take out this period in the 20th century when a lot of commercial forests were planted very close to these 
important nature reserve sites. And there's a conflict then when you're looking at forests between ancient trees, old trees, trees with memories associated with them, trees with nature conservation value, and new forests, plantations. This is true across the Mediterranean world in Italy and in uh, other parts in Spain and France, uh, where you get in the 1920s and 30s, you got a great, a great uh, development of new forests to planting up areas which were, which were bare and which were seen as unproductive. Now, today, many of those areas, particularly in the Mediterranean, are subject to fire and fire risk. This is, to be frank, uh, uh, looking out of the window here, much less of a problem in England where it seems to rain most days, but it is still an issue. But the principal uh, problem with uh, foresting with conifers, uh, large areas in Scotland, England and Wales in the 1920s and 30s was the fact that people did not like the trees. These, what they were saw as new trees, foreign trees, these weren't ancient oaks. And so the authorities produced a lot of tourist booklets to try and, as it were, improve perceptions of what these trees were like. And so they were, had wood engravings uh, and pictures of people going horse riding, tourist horse riding through the open glades within the woods. So that's an, that's an interesting development there in terms of tourism. What about uh, what do people want to see in, in, in woods and, and trees? What do people engage in? Uh, uh, and I suppose one could look at the very close nature of the woodland flora. So we've got in an English woodland and in, in many, uh, many European woods too, you will have... Um, plants like the this plant Paris quadrifolia or in England in particular lots of these bluebells which is a particular period people will visit the woods and people this in particular in the last two years of the pandemic access to woodlands and going for walks in woodlands has increased in popularity uh, partly through force of circumstance. Also of course one might look at the different seasons so uh, uh, the woods and trees aren't the same all the way through the year, of course. So this is the same road in Scotland at different seasons. And the, the way that one perceives the wood going for a walk through these trees varies from the spring to the summer to the autumn to the winter. You get a different, a different feel. Now, I'd be pleased to know I'm now leaving the cold of England and moving to the uh, Riviera. And just to talk about a particular, as it were, luxurious therapeutic landscape, which was de de uh, developed in the 19th and uh, 19th century in particular, and early 20th century. What uh, we, and this is a work I've done with Pietro Piana and Ross Barzaretti, uh, work on the palm landscapes of the Western Riviera. Now, uh, um, this is particularly in the area around Bordighera. Now, for many hundreds of years, the palms were cultivated uh, uh, until the 1920s for producing palm fronds for religious purposes during the uh, Roman and uh, Jewish festivals of Passover. And there was a big export trade to Rome and also to Eastern Europe. Uh, palms were shown, the unusualness of these palms are shown by particular map symbols on the uh, Vinzoni map of 1743. Watercolour, uh, people on the Grand Tour, would watercolours taken from the coast would show the palms particularly. Uh, and then, of course, perhaps more famously, uh, artists, particularly Monet in 1884, painting at Bordighera, picking out the palms. He found them particularly difficult to paint. And also this was on a field visit today uh, at Val de Sasso um, at Bordighera, showing the palms still dominant and still an important part of that tourism market. 
And what happened in the 19th century and the early 20th century was that as the market for palm funds declined, the palms became associated with international wealthy tourism. Uh, and, for example, one has at Nervi, for example, uh, one can see here the way that the tourist posters in the 1920s and 30s emphasised the palms. And, of course, in the same park today, there are pines, but there are also palms uh, 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 in at, at Nervi. So these, as it were, became associated with a luxurious and warm uh, uh, um, place to have therapy, particularly from diseases like tuberculosis uh, and, um, and also to give people the sense of becoming a tropical, warm. This was particularly popular with people from Northern Europe. So you can see here, just to make the point that trees are becoming important from the point of view of uh, symbolizing particular therapeutic landscapes. But today we've got a different uh, uh, idea, this idea of rewilding large areas of the countryside. And this is again from work I've done with Pietro. This is looking at um, a, a little village in um, at Savignone, north of Genoa. This has a long history, and this is just to make the point that there's a long history of this therapy in landscape. So we have a hydrotherapy hydrotherapical, uh, I can't really say that word, stay hotel developed in the 19th century, open hillsides uh, if, uh, in the background with some trees. Now, as in a lot of Italy, these distant and fairly bare slopes have become heavily wooded in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. Here's a photograph from the 1904 showing a religious procession in those hills fairly bare and open but if you go there today uh, they're now regenerated with a lot of trees this is a rewilding uh, so you might get um, here's some examples here uh, a rewilded a sort of abandoned landscape uh, with chestnut disease trees widely damaged by black ice some signs of tourism uh, um, and here I think we then need to look at the types of tourism that are developing here. On the right, you might have this sort of old fashioned, as it were, tourism where people go, stroll, look at the, look at the medieval castles which are in there. But also here, a much more sort of um, uh, vigorous uh, uh, tourism associated with mountain biking and long distance hiking. So we get that big development. And how are people looking at those trees and woodlands? Are they seeing these abandoned woodlands as exciting places of rewilding, getting new animals and, uh, uh, and, and nature conservation? Or are they seeing them as a ways in which traditional agriculture, the old chestnut orchards are becoming abandoned and left behind? And I suppose moving then on, and I say I'm moving on quickly to look at different case studies, to think about the way these landscapes have been used for tourism and therapeutic landscapes. Look at the map of the area. We've got the old chestnut and abandoned orchards. But if we see here the Colonia Montana di, Mon di Maggio, uh, and if you go there today, uh, uh, there is the building, completely abandoned, derelict. But on the side of it, you see various representations, including this 1930s idea. There it is. You've got uh, ballooning, flying, skiing uh, and walking. The idea of this place to go to recuperate from the, the uh, disease ridden cities uh, uh, and to recover during the summer and the winter in these areas. But this place, of course, like many others of these, is abandoned. Now, another way, and at the same period, of course, and slightly later, and moving away from Italy briefly, uh, we can think of the, um, um, the, the, the Corbusier's idea of trees in the city. Uh, uh, um, and this is uh, uh, some work I'm doing with um, uh, 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 researchers with Nevin Tanderic in, in uh, Zagreb. And, we, and he's looking at the ways in which the parks and the cities are used and how the green spaces have changed. 
and I have from the ideas in the 1960s uh, where the tower blocks are all in the uh, are set in trees and woods, but also the pressure on these open areas now. On the right here, we have garages which were built in former open spaces because of the demand for car parking spaces on these areas. So there's a battle. Also, there's a way in which these city parks are being redeveloped and monetized in different ways with festivals and shows and Christmas markets and so forth. If we also think about trees in cities, we also might think of what sort of trees are there? So if one goes to the French town of Troyes, for example, we can see examples of, 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 as it were, trees which aren't traditionally associated with that area, but that are now because of the availability of large sums of money and the movability of trees. Uh, we have palm trees. This is, I suppose, global warming. Even in northern France, a palm tree set up. Also in the same streets, uh, a tree cut in the shape of a Japanese uh, uh, style pine tree. And yet these are set in medieval and 18th century streets. Um, what does that mean, I suppose, in terms of global tourism, but also uh, where did that palm tree come from? And how does that relate to the spread of tree diseases, which we need to think about, which is a big issue, as we know, in street trees? Uh, um, and really, just to the last few slides, just to give you warning that I am going to finish fairly soon, you'll be pleased to know, is to think of Rome and the pines of Rome, uh, which, of course, in terms of music and literature are, are crucially important in terms of the idea of Rome from, uh, for uh, many centuries. Of course, these trees, as we know, are also uh, subject to uh, tree diseases. If one just thinks of the way not only Romans and Italians, but also uh, foreign artists equate, equate uh, uh, pine trees with, um, with uh, uh, Rome, one can think of artists such as Cosins and Richard Wilson, who often in their paintings of Rome in the 18th century would put pine trees very strongly in their images. Um, there's one slide here just to show there's no time to go through it in detail, but we have the art collector George Beaumont and the poet William Wordsworth, uh, both of whom loved Rome and visited it. And uh, Beaumont uh, had visited several times and noticed that pine trees were disappearing and was concerned about them being cut down. So he paid for one to be preserved on a particular hillside. And Wordsworth later visited that slope and then was able to use that tree to memorize his old friend. Uh, Wordsworth said, having ascended Monte Maria, I could not resist embracing the trunk of this interesting monument of uh, his friend's feelings for the beauties of nature and the power of that art which he loved so much. Uh, so just to end on a particular uh, tree in Rome, I don't know how many of you in Rome have been to uh, Tasso's Oak. Uh, um, I went there in 2015. Many people went to look at Tasso's Oak. This is this is a painting by a drawing by Turner of Tasso's Oak. This is Torquato of Tasso, who uh, who is reputed to have that le left his last few uh, days shading under this oak tree. It became famous. Goethe visited it. Many painters, many other people visited it. There's a plaque here from uh, 1898 celebrating the oak. If you go to that site today, well, in 2015, it was slightly sad uh, uh, because here's the oak. Unfortunately, I think entirely dead. There is a large oak nearby, which if one was a romantic, one could say was possibly an acorn from Tasso's oak. But interestingly, what do we get growing vigorously nearby it? We get the tree Elanthus altissima, an introduced tree, the tree of heaven, which is now seen as a, an urban threat uh, uh, because it's spread so vigorously and grows so fast. So I imagine if one's managing Tasso's oak, does one say, 
well, here's a very vigorous new tree which is growing well. Let's grow that one up to tell another story about urban trees and another type of tourism and, and landscape. Or do we try and preserve uh, the ancient oak? So I'm just going to end there. I've got a last slide. I'm just going to flip up for people who uh, want to talk, uh, look at any further information about some of that, uh, some of that research. Uh, and that is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And of course, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. I hope you were able to hear that. Sì, io lascerei forse la parola a Marina. Io um, I have uh, um, I, I appreciated a lot this uh, this, this um, intervention, this presentation. Uh, personally, as an environmental psychologist, I'm very attracted by everything that has to do with the uh, features of the environment and uh, the way people relate to them. And I enjoyed a lot this uh, historical uh, um, excursus uh, um, um, from the uh, to, to that highlighted the way in which uh, the the landscape and the use of trees change uh, through the history. So it's very was very interesting. Um, I don't know if Marina Mura or if uh, anyone would would like to uh, has questions uh, intervention. There is Anna Maria uh, De Rosa who would like to um, to uh, ask something. So um, Anna Maria, go ahead. Thank you very much. I really appreciate and enjoy, and it's more than a question, really a very positive comment from my side, because you touch a very important point, which is uh, most mainly forgotten even by social psychology, environmental psychology, who just look, uh, let's say, at actual attitude, uh, rather than anchoring the what I I prefer to consider social representation as a sort of a sub-disciplinary uh, view on uh, on the intersection of uh, the system of belief, the attitude, the, the the system of value, and also the related action, and uh, even institutional and governmental policy, because there is an individual, but there are a group, but there are institutions, and all these social discourses and action are articulated, but mainly anchored into collective and social memory. So the place identity does not start see, uh, from a minute, it's a long process of a building. And uh, my final comment is the great appreciation for basing your uh, communication also using the communicative channel iconographic. Mm. Uh, so really, it is a great pleasure to discover you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I see, uh, rather than your name, unknown. <laughs> oh! Yeah? I don't I know if I can I... edit that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I... Probably I may have a problem with the internet in this uh, connection because probably the electricity. I don't know, there are some problem here because often I am in a rural area. <laughs> in one. Ah, yeah, ci sentiamo benissimo, quindi non abbiamo problemi. Ma il video. There is some problem. Video. Okay, excuse me, but uh, uh, you. Uh, uh, appear as unknown, and I want to really speak better your name, which I okay. Can... My name, I, try, I can um, show the that last slide, perhaps that's got my name on it, or um, okay. I'm sure that Elena and Paula can uh, can send me. can send that. Yes, I okay. just to say thank you very much, Anna, Anna Maria. Uh, my name is Charles Watkins, <laughs> and. Uh, I will, if you, uh, I'm sure it's it's on the program, isn't it, I think. Uh, there we are. Thank you very much. There, look at that. Um, but just to say, yes, I think the, the one thing that I think, and it relates to Maria Luisa's talk too, is the importance of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work in this. So, uh, uh, iconographical methods, but also... Um, historical, but also psychology, uh, interviews, uh, 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 um, 
and working with, for example, foresters who are often treated differently to other types of people so that the knowledge of an understanding of the management of landscapes and uh, trees and forests is something where I think there's a lot of rich potential for future work uh, and also interdisciplinary but also international work I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>